All right, welcome, welcome everyone. Thank you for being here. I'm Janine Johnston and I have a special guest today that I wanna interview because he's got like some amazing stories to share. He's done a lot of things. And my purpose for interviewing today is for my special guest, his name is Ron Clifford and I want him to share with everyone the impact that he's made and you know his why and things like that so welcome ron welcome Thank to you. a virtual Hello. hawaii interview <laughs> <laughs> yeah i'm way up in canada so we're we're literally half a world away it's incredible we are wow. but you know the flights are cheap from here to canada and from are they? Canada to here <laughs> well, i don't know but uh coming out of pearson in toronto is one of the most expensive airports to fly out of in the world and uh, yeah, so flying anywhere, even within Canada, is quite expensive. Oh, well, you got to get here one day. I do. I definitely do. <laughs> okay, awesome. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to read your, read your bio before you get into sharing your wonderful story. All right, so here we go. So Ron Clifford, he is a visual storyteller. He's a photographer from North from north of Toronto, Ontario in Canada. He shoots portraits of people and he shoots portraits of nature. As a portrait photographer, he helps people tell their story through masterful photographs. They can hang on their walls, hold in their hands and share with those they love. And as a nature and wildlife photographer, I capture, or excuse me, he captures images of extreme places of our world. He always says, do what you can't help but do. And for me, or for him, that is to explore the natural world, photograph the people and places in it and teach others to do the same. So thank you very much. Thank you again for being here. Well, now, I know here. you have some wonderful stories to tell. And so because I want you to share like the impact that you're making, whether it's in your family, in your community, or it sounds like more like you're making an impact in the world. I want you to share that with everyone and your why, like that deep why that uh, why you're doing what you're doing. Yeah. And I want you to go as far back as you need to, even from when you were a child, because from what I've learned interviewing people is that it always started as a child. And it's really interesting to hear some of these um, stories from childhood. So take us back as far as you need up until you, where you are now and and the things that you're doing now. <laughs> yeah, that could take some <laughs> Don't time. Don't be ashamed. I'll, I'll, I'll try and, I'll try and I, uh, keep it short. Um, <laughs> this could take us all afternoon if I go that far back. So I always tell people I was born an artist. I, I knew in my heart that I was an artist. You know how some people, they say, you know, I want to be a fireman. I want to be a doctor. I want to be a lawyer. I said, I am an artist. And so immediately well, there's something you different. You were? Hey? How old do you think you were when you actually well, I know for said sure that. 10, 10 years old, I, I, was, I was an artist. All I wanted to do was draw things. Uh, Any time I was had a time, I'd just give me paper and pencils and crayons and markers. And I would do that. I always wanted to do things with my hands. Oh, so you, at that time, you didn't pick up a camera yet then? Not yet. No, no. See, the, the camera comes later. And it's, a, it's, a, it's a, an interesting part of my story because um, I always said, if it went, not even if, when I write a book, it'll be called, it's not about the camera. Um, even though I'm a professional photographer and I travel the world now, uh, uh, the, it's, not because, it's not the camera. The camera is a tool of connection. Mm -hmm. that lets me see the world and connect with people. And so really that's the heart of my why is, is not that I'm a photographer or an artist, which I am, but that photography and my creativity has connected me to a world of people that want to <laughs> photograph and create. So for very young, I was drawing and I always wanted to be, I don't know if you're familiar, a wonderful Canadian artist named Robert Bateman. He's a wildlife painter. And in this part of the world, he's very famous. And he does beautiful wildlife work in acrylics. And um, 
I always aspired to be like him. I wanted to be a painter and draw and do wildlife and, and did quite a bit when I was younger. In high school, though, uh, what happened was I ran out of art classes. I'd taken something like 20-something art classes. I went to some specialized art schools. Wow. So even, even coming out of, you know, grade eight and going into grade nine at that, that young age, I had to apply with a portfolio to get into these schools. And so I was in art school at a young age, and I had taken all the art courses I could, and I didn't want to take any other courses. I just wanted to finish with art. And the only two left were photography courses. So my brother said to me, he said, Ron, why don't you take these photography courses? I think you'd really enjoy them. And I said, yeah, but that's photography. It's not real art. You know, that's what I said. <laughs> <laughs> See what happens I, when you talk like that, right? <laughs> yeah, I, I apologize to those that understand the difference that now that I realize that was just a lie I told myself. Photography <laughs> is real art. Mm -hmm. but when I took my first photography class, there was two grade uh, 10 and grade 11 photography class. I put the camera in front of my face and and it was incredible. It was it was like you know the the, the sky <laughs> opened up and the angels sang. The heavens parted. Oh, yeah. But there was that lie inside that I told myself that it's not real art. So I couldn't I couldn't be too strongly connected to photography. I could do photography. I did the yearbook. I actually uh, when I left school, I didn't get into art college right away, which was a shock. Part of my story was was I I never thought that I wouldn't be accepted to art college. I was never even a question. I, I was an artist. Of course, I'm going to art college. Mm -hmm. But they said at the time, no, um, they, they, what, I was, what I was working on, this wildlife stuff, wasn't what they were after. And so I didn't get accepted Aww. right away. And I had to go to work. <laughs> and uh, so I did two things. I, I was doing photography already. And so I started doing more and doing weddings and portraits. And I also started to run a, a house painting business because I had to earn money. So let me just ask you a quick question. When you started doing weddings and uh, shoot photography, was it an actual business or you were, oh, you did, okay. Yeah, so I went into business as a photographer, uh, but I also was doing contracting and thinking all of this was going to lead to me going back to art school. And although I did take part-time courses in art school, I never went back full-time. Um, I can fast forward a long way, but while I was doing both these things, painting houses and and uh, doing contracting and doing photography and some art, I was working seven days a week, working weekends, doing weddings and, you know, during the week full time doing contracting and uh, evenings meeting clients. And my wife and I, our family was growing and um, basically I had to choose which one I would do. And I chose contracting. Oddly, I thought it was the safe bet. You know, I thought it was the thing I should do. This is talking about your why, because I didn't believe at the time that photography was real art or it was a real profession. I had these inner voices telling me that I had to do something more physical and meaningful that for work. And those other things were things you did because they were fun. And, you know, not to interrupt your story, but yeah. back then... You know, that was just kind of people's, that was people's attitudes at the time. Oh, you know, it's oh, not like yeah. now in the last 10 years, right? F photography and art, you can make a wonderful business out of it. But back then, you know, it wasn't like how it is now. No. So my my passion for photography was, it was there. But these things that I told myself inside about it not being legitimate as my thing, the mm -hmm. thing I wanted to do prevented me from doing it honestly until I was in my 40s. And so while I photographed all my life, I didn't come back to it as a full-time career till much later. And and I'm going to I'm going to cut out a bunch of the middle of the story because what I did I I raised a family, I ran a business, I had employees, I worked hard and it nearly mm -hmm. killed me. And so yeah. um, I actually woke up in the hospital uh, uh, and I had a bit of a, not a bit, I had a, had a big breakdown and life kind of crumbled in and I found myself unable to do anything, not contracting, not photography, not 
even staying awake for more than three hours at a time. Yeah. And um, I did do a, a TED talk and, and the TED talk is called The Bipolar Photographer. We didn't share this beforehand, but it's funny because I traveled to the polar regions, both the south in Antarctica and to the north. And so I'm quite literally a bipolar photographer. But several years ago, while I was in the hospital, I was diagnosed with bipolar disorder. And um, I was in the hospital because I had been being treated for depressive illnesses and other things, but they had missed the diagnosis for bipolar disorder until then. So while I was in the hospital, I, I had a fantastic doctor who identified what was going on and helped me with some medications at the time to stabilize me. And mm -hmm. as I began to get clear, my wife visited me one day and she said, "Hun, when were you happy? Because I was, I was terribly depressed. I was, I was horribly depressed. And I said, when I was photographing, excuse me, this guy always gets emotional. When I was photographing and when I was teaching and when I was retouching, because part of what I did to connect art and photography was retouching. And she said to me then, this was the most amazing thing. She said to me then, hon, whatever it takes, that's now what you do. That's amazing. You have an amazing wife. Tell her I said that. I will. So I always get choked up, you know. And so that started a long journey to moving toward photography and going back to teaching. And I discovered that um, my strength is in mentoring others' creativity. And so I mentor others. And so my why isn't the camera. It was never the camera. Like, I love photography and I've embraced it as my art form. Mm -hmm. I've embraced it as the thing that I create with. I, I make portraits. And like I say, I'm a portrait photographer, but not just people of everything around me. I, it's all about revealing character. And so that's what I do. I reveal character in everything I experience. And then I help others do the same. So others who are trying this photography thing, who find they have this deep passion and love for it, I help them by mentoring them with encouragement and permission and education to level up their skills. And to me, that's the most re rewarding thing in the world is to be involved in another creator's life and helping them overcome the things that took me a lifetime to overcome. Yeah, I love that. And I totally agree with that too. I feel like that, that I like to be a part of people's lives that I help in that way as well. Yeah. yeah. And so that's led to what I do between uh, traveling to extreme places. And I think I love extreme places because I'm an extreme character. There's, <laughs> nothing, there's nothing just level, complete. Like the only thing that's level about me is is my 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 voice maybe is kind of level. <laughs> yeah, you have a level, calm voice. <laughs> Everything else is all over the place. And um, I'm really good at helping people who are distracted and creative uh, focus and stay on track. And I discovered that photographers, more than any other group of people, are highly distracted. They're mm -hmm. very distractible. And so kind of my, my unique give or my unique gift is helping distracted people stay focused and breaking down big lofty goals into little actionable steps. That is a great thing that you're doing because mm -hmm. I consider myself highly creative and I am very distractible. Yeah, it, <laughs> it seems doesn't take much to hand in get hand. me distracted. Yeah. <laughs> and people so, people like that, like me, need your need your help. <laughs> yeah. I always question whether, you know, everybody's a coach these days, right? Everybody goes into coaching and mm -hmm. I, I kind of push back on that a bit, even though one of the most um I guess the most vulnerable things I did is several years ago, I was taking a, a creative live course and it was about moving into the artist that you are. And for me, it was photography. And they had us do this exercise. And the exercise was to go on Facebook or social media and ask your audience. And at the time, I had a good audience on social media. Uh, use one word to describe me. So I went online and I, on Facebook and I said, um, I'm doing this exercise for a course I'm in. Can you, in one word, describe me? Oh. And there were two things. 
Uh, first, it was my most commented on post in history. And that was really important because uh, at that time, I think I had about 3 million online followers on the Google Plus platform. Wow. And so it was a platform that photographers loved. And so I connected with my people there and I grew a large following. On Facebook, I didn't have such a large following, but I had this immense amount of outpouring from the people that knew me on Facebook. And I learned that, first of all, they couldn't count because very few people could describe me in one word. <laughs> <laughs> and the, the, the words that came up most often were guide, mentor, leader, father, this, this picture of not simply a teacher, but as a mentor to mentors. And I had been resisting moving into that for a long time. Mm -hmm. And that was the day I said, that's, that's, that's it. That's, that's my gift to the world right there. That is your gift. And you know, let me ask you, because you resisted it. Now, they, there may be somebody who will watch this or who's watching, you know, maybe in that same space where they're resisting something. But it seems like everything or everyone is telling them that this is the thing, but you were resisting the coaching and the mentoring part. Now, can you tell me why you resisted it? Yeah, I'll, I'll tell you exactly why. I see a lot of people in the coaching industry who haven't actually mastered something, mm. try to help somebody master something. And I, I wanted to be sure that I was at a level that I felt I had something meaningful to contribute. And again, we're going to go back to lies that you tell yourself because the truth is mm -hmm. you can mentor somebody as soon as you've learned to do something proficiently. You don't have to be the very best at it. You have to understand how to do something proficiently and then share that with somebody else. The whole master-apprentice relationship of days gone by is built on that. Yeah. And of course, the higher level you are in mastery, the more you can help people at a higher level. Yes. But it doesn't mean that you can't mentor somebody who's not already at a super high level. Mm -hmm. And so I, I had to get rid of that first. I also had to get rid of this. I thought you had to be wildly financially successful at something before helping somebody else do it. I don't know where that lie came from. No, you know, that is a good point that you bring up. Thank you for saying that yeah. because I know I've heard other people talk like that. And I actually felt like that too many years ago. Yeah. So thank you for saying that. Yeah. So what I learned was that my, my, my character, my, my gift to help others just required me to get out of my own way. Mm -hmm. And uh, I learned slowly over time that, I really was good at it. I really was able to help people overcome. And um, let me share a story. See, I, I'm i more comfortable talking about myself now, but I prefer to talk about other people. Absolutely. You can, so you can I'm share, share a story. whatever story I, I, have, I have hundreds of stories. Okay. I'm going to share this one story because this was recent. I have a friend named Dave. In I met Dave on a cross Canada road trip. We were going to go out to Alberta to meet up with some photographers that participate in a photography scavenger hunt online. Oh. And so we had previously done a Vegas meetup and we were going to go across Canada, just a small group of us, uh, his wife and him, myself, another friend named Derek and Liz. And we we're going to go and meet some people that we'd met online because I had a huge following going across Canada. He said, why don't you jump in the van? He said, We're, we got time and uh, you hop in with us and we'll head across Canada and we'll meet up with people at West and we'll have a good time. Well, Dave wasn't a photographer. He was a, uh, he did the uh, geocaching. It was his wife that was involved in the photography scavenger hunt that wanted to do these things, but he'd made friendships. And so he brought a little point and shoot camera and a little toy <laughs> like a little Lego toy that he was taking pictures of in front of these roadside attractions across Canada. Oh, interesting. Just fun, right? Yeah. When we finished the road trip, Dave got really serious about photography. He said, this has been so much fun. I'm going to dive in and pursue it more. 
because he got a taste of me photographing landscapes and portraits and meeting up with other photographers and being around this whole environment of photography. He, he kind of gave in, he bought a camera, him and his wife got even deeper into it. Then he joined my mentoring program. At the time it was on Google Plus. And then he, he, he came up with me through mentoring online. And then just this past, before COVID hit, this past year, uh, Kelby Media has something called Photoshop World. Photographers who would listen know what this is. It's like the, one of the biggest conferences for photographers in the world. Oh. And they give out a guru award for Photoshop excellence. And uh, in Florida this year, he won the Photoshop guru award for his oh, toy photography. Wow. And so a pivotal shift for him, and this is about mentoring. The shift that happened for him was while we were in our one-on-one -on -one together, we were mentoring together. He said, Ron, I love this toy photography, but it's not real photography. Now, remember, I, I came from, oh, I love photography, but it's not real art. <laughs> You're right. And I said, Dave, why do you say that? Why can't it be real photography? Why can't you be the best toy photographer? Mm -hmm. Why can't you create wonderful toy photography creations and do Photoshop? And so he started to do that with models him and his kids built like of Star Wars and mm -hmm. in his backyard with lights and, you know, blowing flower to be like smoke and snow and created wow. these fantasy toy images. And he went and won the photography Photoshop guru award this year. That is so cool. That sounds like a lot of fun though, building yeah. Legos and. But that's a that. success story for mentoring about helping somebody else overcome those lies mm -hmm. they're telling themselves because he said people would never take him seriously as a toy right. photographer. And, that, well, and you heard true. that say, you heard that when he said that to you, you heard that in your I head. Yeah. What I said to myself about right. photography, not being real art. And it's no, like if you've got something that you want to do, go and do it, go and get really good at it and see where it goes. Now he's not a full-time photographer. He still works a job that he loves mm -hmm. and does his part-time but he's taking it to a level where he's well respected. That's neat. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. So you never know what could be possible, right? Until you actually just do something. Yeah. So the the long way around answering the question what is my why? Mm -hmm. My why is to help other people reach their potential. Um I I I want to reach my potential. I believe in life that there's this thing that we keep reaching for and we never actually get there. Every time we get closer, it moves further away. Right. The better we get, the better we yeah. want to be. So there's more when, work we need to do. That's right. So when I say I want to help people reach their potential, I want to help them continue to reach for better as they grow. And um, that's what I get to do. That's what I, I'm, that's this is what I'm doing. Yeah. That sounds like a wonderful thing to wake up to. Like I always say, that people need something to wake up to every morning that gets them excited. And, um, you know, it's, it, that's why I want to be able to showcase wonderful people like you who are doing things like that, that light you up. And, you know, it's something for you to get excited about when you wake up and, you know, to have a life like that, yeah. it, you know, people need that even more so now. Yeah. I you had mentioned that, you know, when I was growing up, it was pretty common. Like my mom's opinion was, uh, if you want to be an artist, you'll be broke for all your life. Right. That's the voice in your head, right? Oh. Your, your mother says, no, artists die poor. They don't make money until they're dead. So was there anyone ever in your childhood that supported you in any way? Oh, yeah, they, the opposite, my dad. My dad said, you got to do what you love because if you do something just because you think it'll make money, you're going to be miserable. Yeah. Do what you love. So I had these two voices, these two, maybe, maybe that causes bipolar issue. Who knows? <laughs> well, and, the, and that is sometimes where, how we live our life, right? We hear the voices of our parents or our siblings, if we have any, and they're just constantly in our head sometimes. But what's funny, I, I have, I, I admired Robert Bateman, for example, and, mm -hmm. And he did what he loved. 
And he started later in life too. I don't think he started seriously painting until he was in his 40s. He was a school teacher. And he became one of Canada's foremost painters and very successful wow. while he was alive. He's still alive. I believe Robert's still alive. But uh, so these are just things we're telling us. Somebody told me this as a kid. I, mm -hmm. I absorbed it. I believed it. And then it took years for me to act differently on it. And so I hope that one of my gifts is be able to speak into other people's lives and say, ah, 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 careful, that might be a lie you're telling yourself. Let's look at it. Yeah. Is that really true? Yeah. Yeah. Most of the time we tell ourselves all these lies that aren't, aren't helping us at all. They're just crippling. Yeah. Yeah. And we don't, we don't see it right away. Often we need a guide. We need somebody who has experienced breaking through that to just reach a hand out and say, maybe that's not the truth. Maybe that's just something you're telling yourself and then help us through that process. That's, I think ideally that's what coaching and mentoring does. Mm -hmm. I just happen to do it with photographers because I find they're of a like mind. So I, I do it best with other photographers or creatives. Yeah, absolutely. That's a great way to help people. And I mean, there are, I mean, every time I, I look online at photographers and their social media, there's like, hundreds of thousands of people doing photography now. Yeah. And it's just so incredible how you see more and more creative people actually getting out there and doing their creative art. I call it a gift from God. You know, we all have gifts that we were given and these people are just doing wonderful creative things out there. And it's so exciting. You know, you don't have to have a job that you hate to earn a living nowadays. Yeah especially with everything so much online. I mean, even more so now with all that is going on, but even more so being online, you can do so much with your gifts. Yeah. And the online world really opened up that to me because I was able to um, reach people around the world instead of just in my own community. And I wasn't held back by any, what, what we would call industry gatekeepers who, you know, mm -hmm you only get in if you're accepted, yeah. you know? Yeah. Get, you don't just, have to bribe the gatekeeper now. <laughs> no, no. I just, I just, I'm out there. I, I put it out to the world. This is who I am and this is what I do. And if you receive it, that's wonderful. And it, it's really shifted the landscape of who we can serve. It really has. Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah. I see that all the time and it's really exciting because there's more and more people realizing that that the creative gifts that they have um, can affect so many people's lives around the world, not just in their community. You know, back in the day where when I was going to craft fairs, you know, selling what I made and things like that, back then, this was over 25 years ago, that's the only way you could make money. Yeah. You know, they didn't have this whole online thing. It was just selling at craft fairs or that's to right. people that you yeah. know. And you couldn't really make a, a living like that back then. No, so. It was always going to be something part-time. Yeah. But if you understand how to get work to the people that uh, connect with it, mm -hmm. you can earn better money. Yeah. And you're, yeah. you're making a difference in people's lives too, not just selling your art, but you're making a difference in their lives mm -hmm. too. Yeah. Yeah. That is yeah. so cool. So yeah. tell me about your business right now. Like, what do you actually, what are you actually doing right now? Are you still traveling around the world taking <laughs> amazing pictures or what are you mainly in, focused in on at mind. this moment? Well, okay, yeah. I should, I should like say before this pandemic, like what were you um, doing so a lot before, of? And then before the pandemic, I was traveling, um, I have three primary destinations that I go and I lead photographers uh, to. And one is Antarctica. That's my favorite place in the world. Ah, tell me why. Um, I have trouble defining the why behind that. It's a place that you can't explain why you love it. When when I went there, I, my first trip was, I was there for five weeks. Oh. And I had to overcome a lot to get there. I had to overcome fear of flying and travel and um, confined spaces. There were a lot of things I had to overcome, but once I was in Antarctica, when we were, I was finally there, it was like nothing I'd ever seen. Mm 
the scale cannot be appreciated in photographs or in movies. You, There's nothing, like for the first three or four days we were along the Antarctic Peninsula, there was heavy cloud cover and I couldn't see very much. A lot of mm -hmm. cloud cover was really low. And then three days the clouds started going up and then the clouds started going up and they, they kept going up and they, they kept going up. And then I was literally, look, my head was straight up looking at the size of the, the mountains oh. and the, the cliffs and the glaciers and the ice was a scale I'd never seen before. What, what is the temperature like over there when you were there? So I traveled to Antarctica in Antarctic summer. So it's usually uh, in, in Celsius, just below, like from zero to eight or 10 below. So it's not extreme cold, but it's cold. And more than the cold, it can get really windy. Antarctica is one of the, is the highest, driest, coldest, windiest place on earth. Okay. And so it, it weather changes minute by minute by minute. Uh, and uh, I think that's what I love about it. So part of my mental health, I mentioned that I had been diagnosed with bipolar disorder. And I live today uh, quite healthily, uh, unmedicated, and just with general mood swings, not with the extremes I once lived with. And one of the reasons is I, I live in the moment. I don't, I don't live for tomorrow or for yesterday. I live here now. And traveling to extreme places forces you to live right now. There's no weather forecast for a half hour from now, never mind tomorrow. You can't, oh. you can't wrap your head around tomorrow when you're in an extreme place. You just have to be in the moment. And so it's the best way to live, to, to live in the moment. And I think that's why Antarctica, more than anywhere, it's the most remote place on Earth. You, you literally have to get into a mindset of moment by moment living. Wow, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I never would have thought about it like that. So so do you feel like now that you realize that you have to live in the moment that you feel alive? More and... so, but I've been home for 3 months and I I I can feel that I can feel getting trapped thinking about yeah. what's going to happen, how am I going to open the studio, what's in 3 months? I, my head is starting to do these things and I have to I have to get into the moment again. How do you do that? How do you personally get back into the moment when when your thoughts are all going all over the place? Well, I thank God that I have dogs here. <laughs> <laughs> and I get to go on walks every day. Um, getting out and get going on walks is very important. Uh, since COVID started, I've watched very little television. Good. So I focus on not letting time sucks take me in mm -hmm. and then i launched a new mentoring platform for photographers and so that's been keeping me busier so i'm now reconnected with my students online and so that helps me stay connected and more in the moment helping others succeed again that was a big missing piece while i was doing all that travel i didn't do as much mentoring and now i'm doing more mentoring so as as travel opens up in the future i'm going to have to find a, a good balance between mentoring and traveling yeah yeah well what a fun dilemma you have right <laughs> yeah 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 i was very wow. fortunate that i could pivot back to mentoring other creatives mm -hmm. and it, it it really saved me uh during this time uh and created an income stream that is really helping and it connected me to my community again it was like everybody was seemed to be just waiting for something like this again yeah, so it, it, they were probably um, excited to see and talk to you again. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Well, talk to us about your program, just in so, case, you know, yeah, there are I'll, other I'll people know. who... So the mentoring program is for photographers who want to reach their uh, next creative level. Like I said, I specialize in helping people take that big picture of where they want to go mm -hmm. and break it down into little steps and move closer and closer. So more than helping people learn how to use the camera, I teach them how to use their eyes and to see and to I like create that. powerful images. And of course, along the way, we learn more about using our camera and, and mm -hmm. tools like Photoshop. Mm -hmm. uh, if you go to ronclifford.com, it's really easy. If you remember my name, you'll know my website. It's ronclifford.com. 
and there's a little little menu part for mentoring. I'm not opening up again to new students until September, but you could sign up there uh, to be notified and to keep up to date on when that's going to happen again, when I take in a new new set of people that, to add to the group we have. And so, yeah, that's the, to, to keep in touch with me. Just go to ronclifford.com. I'm also on Instagram at uh, ron underscore Clifford, and I uh, have other links to other other platforms too. Um, you can find me pretty much everywhere, but if you go to ronclifford.com- If you just search for Ron Clifford, we'll find you. Yeah. If you search on Google for Ron Clifford, I'm, I'm pretty sure I'll show up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, you know, do you have any um, story where somebody, besides that wonderful story you shared of this Lego photographer, do you have any stories of anyone that wrote back to you and was just so grateful that, you know, they were in your mentorship program or um, like anything that was so heartfelt that somebody um, said that you made such a big difference in their life? Yeah, um, I actually keep, a, I, it's a bit self-serving, but I keep a file of when somebody writes to me and um, of testimonies of how what I've helped them see or do has transformed for them. Um, I think about my friend Robin. Robin is um, uh, approaching retirement. And I have a lot of students who are have kids that have grown up or are in retirement. And they're looking to rediscover their creativity. Mm -hmm. And when Robin was young, her and her sister used to compete. She wanted to be an artist, and her sister was the gifted one. Oh. And her mom at a young age, unfortunately, whether she realized the damage she did or not, said, your sister's talented. Don't pursue art. Get a real job. Oh. And so she became an a, a occupational therapist, a clinical psychologist, and she pursued a career in the professional world. She's, she's good at it. She's a wonderful woman. And on uh, many years ago, she decided to take one of my mentoring courses in photography because she was interested in rekindling her creativity. Mm -hmm. And so Robin began to produce some pictures. As phones got better and better, she had these apps that helped her do self-portraiture. And her portraits were deep, sometimes disturbing. And her, her images of these beach scenes where she lived using out of focus areas and blurring were really, really intriguing, like really very creative. And I said, Robin, you're an artist. And it brought her to tears because she believed her whole life mm. the thing that was told to her. She said one of her dreams was to have a gallery show of her self-portrait work. And a couple of years into being mentored by me, she was in a group gallery show in Paris for her self-portrait work. Oh, exciting. Yeah. And it's because she was able to face that lie that say, no, that that was just, you know, and it was, probably wasn't even intended to be malicious. It was something, mm -hmm. you know, someone close to her said that she, she took as truth. Mm -hmm. It wasn't true. She just didn't find her medium. She may not have been good at drawing, Mm -hmm. But she was so cre is so creative and does these incredible artistic works. I, all I could see was when she started doing these, when she's let go of all these notions, all I could see was her work in my mind in, in a gallery. I believed it. And then she believed it. And then it happened. Yeah. That's wonderful. Thank you for sharing that because you have to really take into consideration what you're going to believe um, to be true. You know, we're told a lot of things growing up. And like you said, it's not, it could have not been malicious, but we have to be careful what we want to believe yeah. and what we do believe. Because yeah, be that careful really tell people. Be careful what you tell your kids. Don't, don't close doors to them. Mm -hmm. you know? Just because drawing wasn't her strength didn't yeah. mean she wasn't an artist. And she yeah. believed at the time that she wasn't an artist. But uh, yeah. Yeah. I was really Absolutely. happy to have walked that journey with her. Yeah, that must be really exciting to see somebody come alive like that and to have that shift in every way because it sounded like she shifted mentally, emotionally, and everything. She just shifted and and realized, you know, that she is gifted and 
she probably yeah. felt like a whole weight lifted off of her too. I, I hope that's true. I, I hope that she was able to let go of those preconceptions to really enjoy her art. And so if I was to give advice to a creative person, mm -hmm. whether it's a writer or a musician, uh, a sculptor, someone who draws or paints, a photographer, um, a digital illustrator, it's create work that you love. Like don't get the idea of money out of your head. Get the idea of uh, what people have told you out of your head. Just create work that you love. It could be silly, create it. It could be fun, create it. It could be serious, it could be dark, create it. Something inside you wants to create, let it create. And get out of the way and just create a body of work that you love. And what happens when you do that is that it attracts people to yourself mm -hmm. that will resonate with the work that you've created because it's your most powerful work. Right. And you never know where that's going to lead. I mean, for me, it led to a career, right? It, yeah. I do this as a, this is my living. This is what yeah. I do. <laughs> Very well said. That is perfect. I think out of all the key takeaways, I think that is probably the most powerful is create work that you love. Yeah. Because it's not an unnatural thing. It's, it's natural coming from you. That is so powerful. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, I'm, I'm happy to. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I hope everyone who's watching this and who's going to watch this takes that, you know, to heart. Yeah, yeah. I hope so. I don't yeah. know your audience, but I know we all need to hear that. We do. Yeah. We do. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you so much. This has been really wonderful talking to you and, and hearing about your journey. Is there anything else you feel that you want to share? No, I, I really believe we, we covered a lot of ground. I don't okay, want to muddy the water. Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much. And again, just repeat your um, how to get in touch with you. So yeah, ronclifford.com will take you to my website. I have a contact form. If you're interested in mentoring, it's one of the menu items. Uh, I have galleries there. You can see my work. And uh, if you're on Instagram, it's Ron underscore Clifford. And you can find me just typing my name into Google. Okay, wonderful. I'll have that information in the show notes as well. Okay. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate you being here and taking time out of your day. And, and you know, I wish all the best for you. And especially in this mentorship program, it sounds really fun. It is. So. It it's It's a place I... I I, you know, you get up in the morning, you want to spend some time. Yeah. In, yeah. That's what it sounds like. Yeah. All right. Well, Ron Clifford, thank you so much. And you take care and aloha from Hawaii. Aloha. Yeah. And, and I hope you have nice weather in Toronto right now. Oh, it's, <laughs> it's sunny and warm right now. Sunny and warm. Yeah. Okay, good. Yeah. All righty, Ron, take care. I'll see you later. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.